And uh, <clears throat> Psalm 113 is where you should be. Let's look at this. It'll be nine verses that we'll read. The Bible says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Boy, you get, you, you, get, you get an idea that he wants us to praise him in the first two verses. Don't you? If y'all can't get that idea, then quit reading. reading. Amen. All right. Verse 3. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. See, he's not even done it yet. Amen. The Lord is high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in, earth, in the earth? He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill that he may set them with princes, even with the princes of his people. He maketh the barren women to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. Starts with praise the, ye the Lord, ends with praise ye the Lord. Now this right here is the hallelujah chorus for the nation of Israel. The hallelujah chorus for the nation of Israel. Matter of fact, if you go back and you, from this point, from 113 to Psalm 118, these are what, we, what is referred to as the great hallel uh, psalms. And basically, it's the hallelujah chorus. All of them are from 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 100, and of course, 13, and through 118. They're, they are the hallelujah choruses for Israel. I mean, you know, this, these psalms would have been sung, like I said, they sing them for memorization fact and all, but a lot of them are songs anyway. And uh, they're sung throughout the year uh, in, 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 in the Jewish custom. And there, this one particular in Psalm 113 through Psalm 118, this particular section was sung during and still is sung during what we call, what we call Passover, the feasts, some of the feasts. Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. It's sung particularly at the Feast of Passover. And, uh, and they teach... These psalms teach us, and this psalm is teaching us, that God would have His people to be preeminently a praising people. A praising people. Amen. Not one of these. I tell you what, Christianity to me has turned into one of them poots lip religions. In other words, everybody going around dragging the ground, discouraged about everything, and the only time they praise when they're asking for something or begging for something, and they don't ever praise God for anything that God's done for them. And so what I'm what and so this psalm really just adds an exclamation point to that statement because what it is it says look this is one of the starts the hallelujah chorus for the nation of Israel praise ye the Lord let's tell the Lord and praise the Lord for all that He's done for it. the word praise and synonyms of praise is used 186 times no less than 186 times in Psalms period I mean that that's a lot for one word or its synonyms to be used in, in one section of Scripture. And, uh, but no matter, and they, what it's teaching us and what it's doing for us is this, that no matter how bad things are, no matter how tough and dark times come, there's always room to praise the Lord. Amen. There's always room to praise the Lord. And, uh, and again, it's, it's, this, psalm, this psalm here would have been sung preferably and, re, and, and religiously, and I, and I put that tongue-in-cheek word in there, uh, at Passover for the Jews. I think a lot of Jews now go through the motions of singing things and quoting things, and they don't even know what the things they're quoting and singing mean. A lot like Christians coming to church singing the hymns but don't know what they mean. And, uh, you know, when I, when I think about Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, that sin had left a crimson stain, but he and he alone washed it white as snow. 
When I start thinking about that, I think about how poor, wretched of a, of a sinner I am and all that he had to go through in order to forgive me and to pay, pay for my sin debt. Hey, look, I'm glad he paid it all. Because if he left one little penny on it, I wouldn't have better pay that penny. You know what I mean? I, that's just the way it is. And uh, generally when this song, this psalm would have been sung, it would have been sung at evening, at Passover night, before the Passover meal. And uh, so you might say that this psalm is a table of grace psalm. It, it's, you know, it's where the Jews would sit down on Passover night, on Passover evening, and as they, before they take the meal, they sing this song. And uh, so that's sort of like giving grace to the meal that they're about to receive. And uh, because I think about this, when, when the shadows around us lengthen and the circumstances, you know, form around us, you know, we think about how bad our situation is, but I want you to think about another situation. I want you to think about this psalm as it has maybe this meaning of it in the New Testament, that you think about this because Jesus is in the upper room. I want you to think about the upper room. The upper room is where he told his disciples a lot of intimate things that he was going to go and have to do. Okay? That's where he told his disciples that, hey, look, guys, I got to tell you something. I can see it now. I can think now and feel it now. The air is full, is filled with strife and, and anxiousness and anticipation of what Jesus is about to tell them. And Jesus informs those people whom he, they, he had done miracles in front of. He had formed those men that he had been with in bad times and good times, and they fed the 5,000. They've seen miracles. They've seen the dead come back to life. They've seen the lame walk and the deaf hear and the blind see. They've seen all of those miracles. They've, they've gone out camping and sit, slept on the same side of the hill with Jesus. And now he says, I've got to tell you something. The shadow of Calvary lays across the path. Gethsemane is not too far away. Gabbatha. And you say, uh-oh, he's using those big words, isn't he? No, Gabbatha is found in John chapter number 19, verse 13, if you'll look it up. It's a word that you probably read over and you say, well, I don't know what that word means, so you go on and don't think about it anymore. But it's used in John chapter 19, verse 13. Gabbatha is about to happen. Golgotha is in sight. Only hours ahead, and they're going to be taking me away. That's what he's telling his disciples. Never has there been a shadow that's been as dark as that shadow was laying. Never has there been a set of circumstances that a group of men, a group of people, or an individual had to deal with. Because now, the God of heaven is going to be killed, and he's going to give his life on the cross of Calvary. Only hours ahead. There that day sat Jesus with Peter, James, and John, Thomas, and Matthew, and Philip, Nathaniel, all the rest of the disciples. They hang their heads low in anticipation. Peter sitting there just shaking his head said, this is not going to happen on my watch. I'll stop it. John cries because he's the beloved of Jesus and the closest to him. Thomas, ah, it's probably not going to happen. He's the doubter. Is this psalm, perhaps, the psalmist had in mind, not knowing, starts out with praise. The first note that we see in this psalm is praise. He says, praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. I want to look at three things of this psalm real quickly tonight. I'm going to get through it tonight, so just hang with me, okay? First of all, the Lord demands praise. 
It's not something that is asked for. It's demanded of His people. How many times in the Word of God do we hear about praising the Lord? Not just in the Psalms, but in the rest of the Bible. Verse 3 goes on. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. So the first three verses, the Lord is demanding praise. The first note of the psalm, two things under this demand of praise. Number one, now follow me with, follow with me tonight, that number one, His rightful claim to praise. His rightful claim to praise. And that verse one First, the first part and the second part where it says, Praise ye the Lord, praise O ye servants of the Lord. You know, if I were to ask you these questions and ask you to answer the questions, then I think you would answer them in affirmative. In other words, should we praise God for number one, because He's a good God. Amen. Amen. He's good to us. Whether we think He is or not, He's good to us. And uh, if I ask you tonight, You know, should we praise God because there is no one like Him in all of the universe? See, if you go over, and one of the things about studying the Word of God is to put all the rest of the Bible together. We we talked about that, right? Well, I'm glad you you mentioned that because I want you to take a trip with me to Jeremiah chapter 10. In Jeremiah chapter number 10, look at what Jeremiah the prophet said. Now remember, we praise the Lord because He's a good God. We praise the Lord because there's none like Him. Amen. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 10. Look with me, verses 6, 7, 8, 9. The Bible says, Therefore as much there is none like unto thee, O Lord. Thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O King of nations? For to thee doth it appertain. For as much as among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. Verse 8, But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanity. vanities. Silver spread into the plates, brought from Tarshish, and gold from Euphaz, the work of a workman, and the hands of the founder, blue and purple is their clothing. They are all the work of cunning man. But verse 10, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. And His wrath, the earth shall tremble, and the nation shall not be able to abide His indignation. The prophet Jeremiah is telling us, that we ought to praise the Lord because there is none like Him. There is none like Him. Number three, not only should we praise Him because He's a good God and because there's none like Him, but number three, He deserves our best. God deserves our best. Where do you think dressing up on Sunday morning going to church came from? Because you ought to put it up because God, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, deserve our best. He deserves what we can go out and pay the most for to wear the best that we can to come before Him. Amen. He deserves, that's the reason when we bring the, the, the fruits of God's, our labors to God's house, we don't bring the leftovers, we bring the first fruits. God doesn't want our leftovers, He wants our first fruits. He deserves them because he's be, he's, he, he is the best. He deserves our best. And also, number four, he deserves a smiling service. A smiling service, not a surely service. Not one of these, uh, you know, whatever you do, whether it's picking up garbage in the parking lot, vacuuming the floor, cleaning the toilets, preaching, teaching a Sunday school class, ushering in 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 the church, doing the sound, singing in the choir, playing an instrument, regardless of what it is, we ought to smile when we serve God. We ought to say, we ain't serving man, we're serving God. We, and He deserves our best. He deserves us doing it with a cheerful heart. He deserves us being there and being loyal and faithful and determined. You know, it's a privilege for you and I to be able to be called into the service of God. You realize that? We get to serve. That's a privilege. Amen. Lord, and, the, and, and you know, I, I think about not only that, 
But the Lord's rightful claim, not only, the, you know, His rightful claim to be served. And I, so I think about not only his, his rightful claim, but I think about number two under that, he, His royal name. I like this. This is good stuff. Because look at the last part of verse 1. He says, praise, what did he say? The Lord? No. Praise the name of the Lord. The name. I believe there's a lot about the name. I taught Sunday school about the names of God, like Elohim, Adonai, uh, uh, Jehovah Shalom, and Jehovah Shema, and Jehovah Tzidit. Kadenu, and Jehovah Nissi, and El Elyon, and El Shaddai, and Jehovah God. But and the names go on and on and on. And the reason throughout the centuries of him writing to the Jewish people and into the church, into the New Testament, the names of God, one after the other, reveals and you know God to us, revelation after revelation. You go from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and guess what? We get to call Jehovah. We get to call Elohim. We get to call El Shaddai. We get to call El Elyon. We get to call Jehovah Jireh. We get to call Jehovah Shalom. We get to call Jehovah Tzedeku. We get to call Him Father. What a privilege. The all-powerful, covenant-keeping God that He is. Because see, His name is a manifold expression of who He is. There's a lot about that name. You know, we have the honor, if you're saved tonight and know Jesus, we have the honor of bearing the name of God. God has given us back our dignity and gave us a new name. Like that song says, amen. There's a new name written down in glory and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. He's given us a name. And I believe, Brother John, I believe he's going to call us by that by name. When, we, when he comes back in the rapture, when the Lord descends with a shout and the voice of the archangel, that shout is going to be everybody's name. Everybody's going to know when to get up. They're going to know when to, they, they, the graves, the graves will know which one to open, which one's not to. Amen. They, they, hey, wherever, I, I don't care if you get eaten by a whale and you're all over the floor of the ocean. God's going to know where you are, and He's going to call you and put you all back together again. It's going to be all right. Amen. It don't matter if you're over here in Rose Hill, Carville. It don't matter half of you somewhere else. It don't matter wherever it is. God, when He calls your name, you're coming up. Amen. I'm telling you, ain't nothing like a name. Because, see, I get to thinking about this thing. See, a lot comes to my mind when I start studying this stuff. It's amazing. I, I, I like It's amazing that, number one, I can come up with it. Number two, it's amazing I get to tell you about it. But it, and, and it's amazing that it's all, hey, it's all true. Amen. I hope y'all get as excited as I do about it. Amen. Amen. I get so excited about it, I get tongue twisted sometimes. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. Look, look what your Bible says. Um, he says, and I like, I like this. You, I, I've looked over that. This is one of my favorite verses of the Bible. I got a bunch of them. And, um, but in, in, in Philippians chapter 3, and verse 14, the Bible says, I press toward the mark. Amen. For the prize, watch this now, of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know we've got a high calling. Woo! We get to serve God. God doesn't want your poop slip service. He wants your smiling service. He don't don't want you to go around there and say, "Oh, oh, 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 today's church again. Oh, Lord, here it comes. I got to go up there and hear that preacher do it again. Lord, help us. Jesus, Lord, I, you know, you drag out of the bed, you drag in there, then you go back to the house. I knew it was going to be that way. It's the way it always is. Well, if you go and don't expect something, don't be surprised when you don't get something. 
People come in here and say, well, y'all ain't friendly. Well, the best thing they do, they come in here, right, and service starts. They leave soon as service is over with. They don't come to nothing else. They come one time a week, and they say, well, ain't nobody friendly. Well, stick around. Somebody might say something. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. This is Wednesday night. I thought it was a Sunday morning, Brother John. Ain't that the truth? Y'all stick with me. We're going to keep going, okay? I get stuck. I, it's easy for me to get stuck, okay? And, um, but I'm thankful Amen. that he's got a royal name. You ready to realize, watch this, in two verses, it says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Verse 2, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Four times in two verses, he uses what name, church? I done taught you this. What name? Jehovah God. That's the name that's above all names. That's the most sacred name of everything. That's the I am that I am that Moses came face to face with in the desert out of a bush. That's the Lord. And folks, listen to me. That's the one that all the enemies one day are going to have to face. But listen, church. He's also the one that you and I one day are going to have to face. We're going to have to stand before Him and give an account of ourselves to God. Not only does the Lord demand praise, but number two, He desires praise. Not only does he demand it, he desires it. There's three themes right here. I'm not going to spend too long. I'm trying my best not to. Okay? But look, it just gets so much, so, it just gets so good. You got to stay a while sometimes. It's like putting that uh, uh, chip of hoy cookie in milk and putting it in between your upper and lower mandibles. And you know, you just, you just put it down and just let it dissolve in your mouth. It's good. It's better than this. This is good stuff. It's like Miss Billy. It's like, it's like some of that warm banana pudding that when you just comes out of the oven, let it sit just for a little while. But don't let it get cold. Let it get, stay warm. And then you reach down in there and get all that, put it up there, and you let it just savor in your mouth. Don't just swallow it. You want it to roll it around in there a little bit. I mean, I just don't want to eat it. I want to enjoy it. Amen. Amen. I like it. She tells me if I get her bowl back, I can get one. <laughs> that, bo- that, 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 bowl, that bowl's got more mileage on it than any bowl in the world. Been in my truck for I don't know how long. <laughs> but when we think about the Lord desires praise, I know y'all think I'm crazy, but you probably think right. But when I think about the Lord desiring praise, I think about three things. And there's four. Look what it says. And the Lord is high above all his na- all nations and his glory above the heavens. First of all is his glory. Now I want to tell you something about God's glory. The Bible tells us that God, I'm going to tell you something about Jehovah. Let me tell you something about Elohim. Let me tell you something about the God El Elyon and Jehovah Nissi, and Jehovah Jireh, and Jehovah Shema, and Jehovah Sidneku. Let me tell you something about him. He's a jealous God. He's a jealous God. The Bible tells us he's a jealous God. Now, you take a trip over there with me to chapter 42 of the book of Isaiah this time, and we look at a verse there called verse 8. Watch what God says through the prophet Isaiah. He says, I... Am Jehovah. You say, preach, that's not what my Bible says. Well, that is what your Bible says. It just says, I am the Lord. Because that's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is Jehovah. Okay? I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise, to grave an image. And church, we're as guilty of it as anybody's ever been in the history of, of Christianity. Uh, you know, when we come to church, we don't come to entertain ourselves. We come to worship a holy God. 
We come to praise a holy God. We come to give glory to a holy God. It's not entertainment in front of a congregation. It's one worship before a holy God. His glory. Thou art worthy. In the book of Revelation, there are creatures that have been created only for the express reason to say, Holy, 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 for thou art holy. I mean, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, year after year, eon after eon, for eternity. That's what their job is. Why? Because he is holy. Why? Because he has glory. And that glory, he, he keeps and he's not going to share it with somebody else. So don't you share it with somebody else. Amen. Number two, not only his glory, but his greatness. Look at verse five. So we're moving pretty good. Just hang on. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high? Who is like unto the Lord our God? Again, Jehovah God. His greatness. Well, I'm glad that you asked that question because we're going to use the book of Isaiah again to answer that question. Because in Isaiah chapter 55, that's a good chapter. You ought to read it sometimes. You ought to read the whole book of Isaiah. It's a good book. Amen. And you can jump over there after that, read Jeremiah and, you know, and all them others. It'll bless you too. Amen. But in in Isaiah 55, look with me in verse 8 and 9. Now, oftentimes, you'll hear me and others quote, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, thus saith the Lord. Okay, that's right. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Look at verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so... Are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts? Look, not only has God got His glory and He's worthy of praise, He is great and worthy of praise. But it gets better. Watch this. It's good. Not only is His glory and His his greatness, but look at His grace in verse 6. Verse 6. Who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. Now, boy, woo! This is one of the shouting times right here. It's shouting time in heaven. That's right. That's a song like that. Shouting time in heaven. Amen. This right here gets you going right here. This will this, 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 this bless you, bless them. It, it gets you. If it don't, you're broke. You need to go check it out. Amen. All right? Now, I want you to think about it. As they're sitting in that upper room, don't forget about the story that I told you. As they sit in that upper room, you thought I forgot about it. But as they sit in that upper room, the Lord had already clothed himself in humbleness. How did he do that? By putting flesh on. See, we think... It, and it is. Don't get me wrong. It is. This is good. It's a good thing. A big thing. A necessary thing. That God took on flesh. Dwelt among us. As John said in John chapter 1 verse 14. And dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. As of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. That's good stuff. We often look at what he did, and that is he came and took on flesh and died on the cross and was buried in a bar tomb because he wasn't going to need him for three days and three nights, and he resurrected the third day. He walked among his people for 40 days. Then he ascended up into heaven waiting for the Father to say, Son, go get him. We say, okay, he came and did all that, but let me ask you something, folks. What did he give up to come here? Amen. Think about what he gave up. He's the king of all kings. The Lord of all lords. He was the creator of the universe. Speaking it into existence. He is by him all things were created and by him all things consist. There's none like him. There's none above him. There's none more powerful. There's none more glorious. But God, that God, gave all of that up to come down and humble himself. And take on flesh. 
And the only reason he did it was because of us. If that don't bless your blesser, Amen. something wrong with you, and you need to go get checked up. I don't believe you're saved if it don't bless you. You say, preach you say that? I sure enough did. That'll get you every time. See, we're going to let the book of Philippians talk for us again. Let the apostle Paul speak to us out of chapter 2, verse number 8. Good stuff. It says this, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. It's bad enough. To go get whooped by somebody that's bigger and badder and stronger than you are. But it's sickening when you got to sit there and put up with something that's inferior to you and let them do it. And that's exactly what Jesus did. We know according to the scriptures that at any time during all the illegal trials, during all of the, 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 the anxiety, the sweat drops of blood in Gethsemane, to the illegal Abatha up there, and you say, what is that Gabatha? That Gabatha is that pavement place where Pilate called everybody into and passed sentence on Jesus Christ. A lot of people say Gabatha is the place where the Sanhedrin met to try capital cases. But where the illegal trials, you know, hit, and, and, and were made, all the lies that were told, all of the rejection that he went through, and not only that's bad enough, but delivered him over to be crucified. And then a Roman soldier taking a cat of nine tails that had pieces of bone and rock and all things they could think about and whipped the Lord with it, pull his skin off of his flesh, how would you, you sitting there and if you got the power, if you were Superman or you were any of these other people that you thought they could do it, you would have come out there and broke those chains and whooped up everybody. But our Lord took it. He humbled himself. And then not only that, he went into the pilot's hall and was made a fool out of. And he should have wiped them all out better than Samson did with the Philistines. But he didn't do it. He didn't sit there and talk. He was like a lamb dumb before his shears, as the Isaiah put it. And he goes on and he said, and he, you know, and they said, we sentence you to die. The whole church at that time said, crucify him, crucify him. We don't want him. Put him on the cross. And then they make Jesus carry the very tree that he created up to Calvary's hill, Golgotha. And they make him get on it. And they took the very nails that God gave him the ability to make and the very steel that made them and nailed him to a cross. At any time, God could have said no. At any time, God could have said, I'm wiping them out and it's over. And then all of us would have died and gone to hell. Aren't, you, aren't we blessed? Amen. Not only does He demand our worship and our praise, but He deserves our praise. Amen. He deserves our praise. What He gave up for us. I'm sorry, He desires our praise. Thirdly, He deserves our praise. Not only does he desire our praise, he deserves our praise. Verses 7, 8, 9. He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifted up the needy out of the dung hill. Y'all stay with me tonight because this is going to, I don't know how it can get better than it is, but it's going to get a little bit better. That he might, may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. Now this is how I think. Now it may be warped. It may be something else. I don't know what it is. But when I read Psalm 113 and I read verse 7, He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth out of the dust, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. I stop right there. And I get to thinking. Okay, David, what are you thinking about? See, I'm trying to get into the mind of the writer. 
Because remember, the Bible was given to us as examples. Right? The best commentary on Scripture is Scripture. So in Psalm 113, it tells me that he raises up the poor, that he may set him, verse 8, with the princes, even the princes of his people. What comes to mind when you think about those verses and you think about David? I'm glad you asked that question, Lisa. Because I want you to take a trip with me in the Scriptures again to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. This is exactly the first place that my mind went to when I read Psalm 113 verses 7 and 8. This is what came to my mind. Because he says, remember what he said in the Psalms, that he brings up the poor to set them with princes. And I think about being brought up from the pit. Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me also up out of the horrible pit and out of the miry clay and set my foot upon a rock and established my goings so that many can see it and trust in the Lord and fear and trust in the Lord. Psalm 40 verses 1 through 3. Then I think about going from the pit into the palace. And you say, "Uh uh-oh, I know what you're going to go to. You're going to the story of Joseph, aren't you? Nope. Good thought, though. But David writing this psalm, saying, I'm bringing up the poor to sit with the princes in the palace and and the princes. My first thought was Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. 2 Samuel. Chapter number 9, look with me in verse number 6. The Bible says, oh, let's go to verse 5. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son, uh, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold, Thy servant. But watch. Watch. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan, thy father's sake. David and Jonathan were best friends. And will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, And thou shalt eat the bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant servant, that thou shouldest look upon such as a dead dog as I am? That's what Mephibosheth said. Then the king that's David, called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him. Because he was a crippled. And thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. I don't see how you read it and not get emotional. Because if you read that story, it's just like us. Here we are. As Mephibosheth decide, described himself as a dog such as myself. That's us. We're sinners. We deserve nothing. We deserve judgment. 
We don't deserve love. We deserve hatred. We deserve to be put in hell for eternity because we're sinners. We don't deserve to be sitting with kings and princes. We deserve to be in the backyard somewhere in the hog pen. That's where we deserve to be. But my God says, I'm going to save you. And I'm going to give you everything that sin took away from you. And I'm going to make you always to eat bread at my table. It was a blessing and a privilege for Mephibosheth to be able to talk in the door of King David's palace. Much less sit at his table and eat. We get to go to the table of a king. We get to meet with the king of all kings. What a privilege is that. He deserves our praise. We come up out of the pit into the palace. His kindness to us. And it reminds me, and I'm going to end with a song. I ain't going to sing it. just going to read it to you. Because these hymns that we have teach us something. That's the reason, church, listen to me. Don't ever get tired of the hymns. I don't care what society does or what the church does. You take a hymn book and you keep it somewhere and you remember the hymns. Because the hymns are pronounced hymns for a reason because they're all about him. Amen. How you like that? I just come up with that. That's pretty good. I like it. I'll keep it. All right? That's mine because I don't think nobody else come up with that one. 175 in your book. This song right here known to us as Hallelujah. What a Savior. That's not the original name of the song. The original name of the song is Man of Sorrows. Because it starts out, Man of Sorrows, what a name. For the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Guilty, vile, helpless we. Spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement can it be. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven's exalted high, hallelujah, what a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransom home to bring, then anew this song we'll sing, hallelujah, what a Savior. You know what this psalm right here is saying to us and what Israel sings at Passover? And what they sing at the Feast of the Tabernacles and the Feast of Pentecost, they're saying without knowing, hallelujah, what a Savior. How dare we come to church with no smiles on our face and no joy in our hearts and can't say hallelujah, what a Savior. Because He is the one that took you off of the road of destruction and hell and hatred and, and destiny to the road to a new name written in glory and to gold streets and to heaven where there's no need of the sun, S-U-N, because the S-O-N will give the light thereof. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you, Lord, that we can go to your word and study it, learn about it, and Lord, just relish in the fact of how good it is. Father, we come to your table tonight, and it's a privilege to be able to sit at your table. It's a privilege to be able to eat, Lord, that food that you put before spiritually. And, Father, I thank you that, Father, it is sweet to, as honey to our mouth, as Jeremiah said. We thank you for that privilege we have to hold this book in our hands, the privilege we have to be able to preach your word, the privilege we have to have a building that we can come and meet in, a privilege we have that we can meet together and, Lord, called into your service, the high calling of God. In Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for our Savior. Hallelujah. What a Savior we have.
for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.